the next election, there's two things that you can take to the bank, lady. One is everything will change and nothing will change. So right. the, the political parties will change, but nothing will change. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, those of you who follow the show, and we're grateful, very grateful, blessed that there are several thousand of you now. God bless you. Uh, You know that we talk a lot on this program about leadership. And there is a crisis of leadership in this country. Uh, it's not just in, in politics, but it's, it's, it's probably most noticeable there. And so we thought it would be great to have someone on the show who has been working in the political theater, as it were, uh, for many years, and who actually has taken stands uh, at, at some personal cost and professional cost in order to stand up for the people, to be a servant leader. And his name is Randy Hillier. Thanks for joining us today, Randy. I've been looking forward to this conversation with you. It's an absolute pleasure, Leighton. Uh, look forward to uh, the conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're going to dive into some topics and learn more about you. Of course, many people will know you and, and the fights that you've been fighting on behalf of really all Canadians. But before we go there, we have our framing aphorisms. These are chosen somewhat in your honor. The first one, don't be offended, is actually from our Prime Minister who has said many things, many hurtful things, many things that might be considered hate speech under his new bill. Uh, this one, I think, should qualify. He said, we are going to end this pandemic by proceeding with the vaccination. There's still a part of the population fiercely against it. They don't believe in science or progress and are very often misogynistic and racist. They take up some space. This leads us as a leader and as a country to make a choice. Do we tolerate these people? Next is from the man who might be our next prime minister. Many people are hoping so. Pierre Polivier, who said, if the carbon tax really was about saving the world, we would presume the largest industrial emitters of carbon would have to pay it. Next from Sophocles, one of the giants of ancient Greece, who said, all men make mistakes, but a good man yields when he knows his course is wrong and repairs the evil. And finally, from a giant of American politics, perhaps their greatest president, many people would say so, Abraham Lincoln, who said, you can please some of the people some of the time, all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can never please all the people all the time. And that's certainly true in politics, as our guest well knows. Well, who's our guest today? Well, it's Randy Hillier. Randy uh, is... uh, before he became a politician, was a licensed construction electrician. People will be glad to know that he actually had a useful job before going into politics. But he's also been a Canadian politician who has served as a member of provincial parliament in the Legislative Assembly of Ontario for 15 years. He also represented the riding of uh, uh, Lanark Frontenac Kingston as an independent MPP from 2019 to 2022. Um, and there's some controversy around uh, how how that situation evolved. Uh, he was uh, initially elected as a member of the Progressive Conservative Party, which no longer exists, uh, and he remained as a member until uh, 2019. Uh, despite announcing he would run for election under the banner of the Ontario First Party in November of 2021, he announced in March 22 he would seek re-election. Uh, he, he sat as an independent uh until the dissolution of parliament on May 3rd, 2022. And as of, uh, and, and, and then afterwards, he, uh, he, all, he went back to a uh, landscaping and excavating uh, services business. So Randy, I want to start here. Uh, I'm interested to know, um, you know, obviously you, you had had uh, some degree of uh, success as a licensed construction electrician. Um, what caused you to decide initially to go into politics? Well, there was one other little interlude. Uh, uh, in in 2002, myself and a few other fellows started a group called the Lanark Landowners Association. And right, our right slogan that. was, this land is our land, back off government. We had <laughs> uh, gotten set up 
with government intrusion into our lives and our properties in rural Ontario. And uh, a few of us got together. Uh, I was chosen to be the president and chief mouthpiece for the organization. Um, and uh, over the next uh, six years, we built that into a very powerful group of about 15,000 members uh, across Ontario. And we were very noted for our uh, aggressive, uh, but intelligent advocacy and opposition to the intrusions into private property and the, uh, for the advancement of the protection, greater protection of property rights in our constitution. We held many tractor rallies, uh, closed down on Queen's Park, Parliament Hill, the government buildings, borders, um, highways, um, and were quite successful. In, but after uh, about six years of very uh, uh, strenuous and exciting, exhilarating um, advocacy, uh, uh, I decided to take a little break and uh, retired from that for a period of time. And it was just one of those things, Leighton, that it fell in my, uh, a couple months after I uh, uh, relinquished leadership of the Landowners Association, which had become the Ontario landowners by then, uh, the, the nomination for the Progressive Conservative uh, uh, Party in Lanark Frontenac came up. And uh, so I threw my hat in the ring and uh, 15 years later, uh, I left. <laughs> <laughs> well, that explains why you got into politics. Obviously, you wanted to, you felt you had something to offer and you want to make a difference in people's lives, especially in your own community, which you served very admirably. But um, like many people, but you perhaps more than others, uh, your life changed very much in the early part of 2020 when we were beset by something that is is commonly called the COVID-19 pandemic. And during that period, you were a staunch opponent of COVID lockdown measures and laws in your province and also nationally. Um, so taking you back, I guess, four years now to that time, uh, when did you first start to realize that something was dreadfully wrong about the way that governments in Canada were handling this quote unquote health crisis? Well, like most people, um, there was a great deal of uncertainty, but it was mm -hmm. obvious within days that what we were doing was wrong and what we were doing was causing far more injury, far more harm, far more despair and uh, anxiety uh, uh, than uh, what COVID was doing. Um, so it wasn't... We declared the state of emergency here in Ontario on March 17th. I, my first opportunity to speak uh, in the legislature was March 26th. And I, at that time, I said, you know, something is wrong. You know, our cure is far worse than the disease. Nobody was seeing anybody dropping dead in the streets. Uh, nobody, uh, the hospitals were closed up and there was nobody in them. Uh, nobody could get medical attention. Uh, people were fraught with anxiety over losing their homes, businesses, incomes, jobs. Um, uh, but we weren't seeing any evidence of an actual pandemic. Uh, we were seeing some uh, some very atrocious actions in our long-term care homes. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I started speaking out first against the state of emergency and the lockdowns and right. then through april you know within a month we knew that there was no pandemic uh, we know even the senior staffers knew that they had overplayed their hand and i spoke about this down in washington recently uh with senator ron johnson at the senate right uh, i saw that you were down there in the u.s with uh your friend, Pastor Hildebrand, who was a yes, recent guest on our program. Yeah, the Canadians uh, reinvaded Washington uh, <laughs> this year. Um, so, so it was obvious that the uh, and we had the political parties like th this was a big con job, and it was a very good con job, Leighton. 
Uh, many people made a, a buckets and gobs full of money out of the con, and many people paid the price. Um, and uh, and many of our politicians also got caught in the con. Um, not all of them. Some of them were part of the con, but most of them, by and large, from what I've seen, uh, got duped uh, with the hysteria, with the uh, uh, fawning adoration and attention, uh, and the uh, uh, and the twenty four seven the hysteria that was being promoted. Um, and, um, but it was obvious to me uh, when the Diamond Princess cruise ship docked, to me, that was the, the real kicker in early April. Right. Because uh, that was like a the absolute best controlled laboratory experiment for COVID. And we found out mm -hmm. at that time that uh, there was no increase in deaths uh, for on the quarantined Diamond Princess uh, mm -hmm. than what happens on any cruise ship. Uh, for you know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, a major cruise ship uh, there's one death per week uh, on a really? cruise ship. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and but it, you know, and for over two months, uh, the Diamond Princess was quarantined at sea. And nine people died from apparently COVID, the same number that would have died if there hadn't been a pandemic. So right, that's right. just one little illustration. There's many of them. And of course, many more, far more uh, credible and scientific individuals uh, uh, came out uh, mm -hmm. with absolute proof that this was mm -hmm. a con job. But your but your situation, you present a very interesting case because, as you say, at that time you were a political insider. Um, you saw what was going on. You saw the corruption. You saw that you could have participated in that. Uh, you could have been one of the ones who went along with that. Who, as as you say, profited. But instead, in June of 2020, you know, you're at a rally. You're protesting it in in, in at Queens Park. And then, you know, that led to all kinds of trouble because then, of course, then you are a dissident. And the, by the fall of 2020, the public health officials were, were you know, coming after you. Undaunted, in November of 2020, there you are again at another rally at Queen's Park. Uh, and then you're out uh, at the end of December. You're, you're at a Christmas. You're, you know, you, you, were, you were just, you're relentless. But what I poked them at every is, opportunity, like, you at, did, at every you opportunity, did. Yes. I would poke them. Um, yes. You know, and, and why? But why, Randy? I mean, you could have gone the other way. You could have filled your pockets with money. Oh, why? why you, you know, know. Uh, and I, I don't want to insult you, but I mean, you, you know, why did why did you turn the other way and expose yourself to all of this public vilification? And uh, really, I mean, you were just you, you took a lot of hits publicly to your reputation for the stances you took against COVID, against the government's handling of COVID, when you could have just gone along and and I've uh, been one of the ones who just quietly filled your pockets. So what, why, why did you make that choice? Well, because I have children and grandchildren and, uh, in the, and, uh, you know, I have a conscience. Uh, uh -huh. and you know, the, this was, as I said, uh, you know, 25 years earlier, uh, I thought government was intruding too much into our lives and our properties and our right. lives. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, we saw on March 17th that we, uh, you know, instead of cracking the door open towards the road to a dystopia and the road to authoritarianism, we swung the door wide open. We, we said, here we are. We are going to travel down this path where you will have no freedom, where the government will be able to tell you how many people you're going to have in your home how many people that you're allowed to have at christmas time um yeah they're, they're going to create bubbles that people will be allowed to circulate within only their confined bubble um that the government will determine when and if you are going to be allowed to conduct your business or to be employed uh, this was this was not uh under any reading of history we know that that the only way people can be safe 
is when their freedoms are safeguarded. Right. And there is no safety in having your freedoms removed. And mm -hmm. this is was part of the con as well, that to make people believe that they were going to be safer mm -hmm. if they mm -hmm. had zero freedoms. And we're still on that path. There, and there's still many Canadians who who yeah. believe that freedom is dangerous, not mm -hmm. slavery. Yeah. And, you know, we would still, I think, still be locked down if it were not for uh, maybe the most important world event of this century, certainly the most important event in Canada that you participated in quite actively. And of course, that's the Freedom Convoy uh, in the early part of, uh, of 2022 that was precipitated by uh, an incident where you called a certain minister uh, a terrorist. <laughs> so listen, I can get, this, this is one of my restrictions on me. I am no, okay. not allowed to speak of certain things. That really? topic is one of them on well, social we won't media. Go the, there courts, then. the courts have been, you, no, no, that's okay. Well, but, yeah. I, you know, but yes, that the, the events of February 2022 in Ottawa were powerful. They were profound. They were, people don't realize that expression of opposition, that magnitude of public opposition, uh, during those events, it was every province in our country and the feds announced that they were ending the mask mandates, that they were yes. ending yes. the curfews, that they were mm -hmm. ending the the travel restrictions. Um, you know, everybody ought to realize, and uh, in a in any government, even in in a communist country, um, the legitimacy of the government comes from the governed. People over, you know, we had done a whole series of no more lockdown rallies in opposition since early in 2020. Um, and people were doing this across the country, but they were they were allowed uh, to be contained and uh, and segregated. What happened in Ottawa is all, everybody came together and there was no way they could be compartmentalized or segregated. And it was uh, obvious to the world now that mm -hmm. Canadians were leading the charge and were going to be successful in ending, mm -hmm. or at least partially ending, yeah. the con job. Well, you, you were. It certainly brought uh, a level of awareness that did not exist before then. But uh, as I go back and I researched uh, the Freedom Convoy and your involvement in it, one of the things that really struck me is that you were the one. You were one of the ones who was calling most vociferously for the opening of a dialogue with the federal government, with the prime minister. Uh, and this is this is really you're at the forefront there, saying, "Look, you know, let's talk about why we're here. Let's talk about what the federal government needs to change in order to, you know, what 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 is causing people, all these people, to be there and and peacefully protesting, but." representative of of the, really the pain that was being suffered throughout the country uh, that dialogue didn't happen and as we sit today it still hasn't happened has it no and, and you know i held a number of press conferences at and during uh, ottawa and and i remember very clearly saying you know this was one of the things nobody was talking to anybody we were all talking over one another uh, mm -hmm. nobody was listening to anything and, you know, again, I've been in elected office for a period of time. And even before that, my my public advocacy role, uh, never in my history had I ever seen. Well, I, I conducted hundreds of protests myself, Leighton uh, and the landowners. And every time we did that, somebody from government would come out to talk with us. Even if it was an, an attempt to placate us, an attempt to co-opt us, or an attempt to actually learn, uh, there was at least the effort shown. And, of course, <coughs> the coward went to the cottage uh, when the trucks rolled in to Ottawa. And, um, and he had painted himself into a trap because he... You know, everybody was either a racist, a misogynist. We were taking up space, um, a homophobic. Um, and of course, when you paint your uh, 
your I, I don't, don't want to use the word adversary, but when you um, paint the other side with those colors, uh, with that, uh, you know, it makes it very difficult, made it impossible for mm-hmm. anybody in government mm-hmm. to have an actual discussion because, you know, yeah. who wants to have a discussion with a racist and who wants to have a mm-hmm. discussion with a, uh, with a homophobe and, you know, whatever other uh, term that they used. Uh, right. So right. There, there was just no uh, ability for him, even if he had wanted to, to talk, uh, he would have had to climb down from that hateful language that he had used. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And instead of mm-hmm. doing that, instead of being humble uh, and saying, well, I shouldn't have used that language, um, he doubled down and said, now, now we're also criminals. Now mm-hmm. there's a criminal conspiracy, an insurrection, an attempt to overthrow our democracy. Uh, mm-hmm. And he just kept digging himself a bigger and bigger hole uh, mm-hmm. until such time that he went too far, even by um, anybody's measure, with the invocation of the Emergency Act, which obviously mm-hmm. has been ruled out of various and unconstitutional sense. Um, but, you know, that's what a liar does. That's what a dishonest person does. A uh, a person with a conscience and a person with integrity would have some humility, some mm-hmm. humbleness and say, uh, and seek forgiveness for their errors. Mm-hmm. Well, this, this gets at something that we were talking about off the top of the show about the concept of servant leadership. And I read that quotation from uh, our prime minister, which you were just paraphrasing. And it sort of begs the question, um, why would a political leader be in opposition or be an adversary of his own people? Um, That seems to be upside down. That seems to be a perversion, right? And, And so here's my, your understanding of leadership. You've spent many years in politics, your concept of leadership is very different from that of the prime ministers. But unfortunately, and I want to get your take on this, it seems as though we have too much of his brand of leadership in our country, a sort of, uh, you know, talk to the hand, do as I say, not as I do, uh, you know, just trust us, we're the experts, um, as opposed to the kind of servant leadership uh, that you, you dedicated your political life to. Would you agree with that? And, and and that's the first part of the question. And how do we fix that? How do, how do we change this picture so we don't have political leaders like Justin Trudeau, you know, who are so frightened to be seen in public that he has a massive, massive armed security detail? How do we get back to a situation like Sean Gretchen 30 years ago when he's kind of bullying his way through a crowd? Uh, it seems as though things are upside down right now. Do you have some ideas about this or what are your thoughts about? about so, uh, about this point i think this is where you know it takes a lot more discussion but let me phrase it frame it up like this uh there's very very few people in elected office or in the public who know how our uh representative democracy is actually designed and how it's intended to function uh, and that uh, largely I, i'm applying that to well it's to everyone uh, the, the people in office don't even understand how the system is designed, other than in a very basic or very elementary uh, style. And and as as a lawyer, I'll I'll frame it this way to you, Layton. You know, in the courts, we the courts are there to mediate and remedy, generally speaking, private disputes. Right. Parliament is a court as well. Uh, we have all the functions of, of a court, and that court is to remedy and mediate public disagreements. Okay, And we do that through a legislative process, uh, mm-hmm. which is much just like an order of the court. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's um, so if we think of it like that, uh, and but our elected members and our don't understand that their purpose is actually as a mediator of public discourse and a mediator of public opposition. You know, whenever you're going to have a society, there are going to be various perspectives and they Mm -hmm. have to be uh, 
reviewed. They have to be uh, debated, discussed, and and find the best course forward. So, mm -hmm. but these days we get leaders who have, you know, nobody's going to confuse uh, Justin Trudeau with an intellectual capacity or even a uh, he, or he even, might. <laughs> or even empathy. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and I would say that is for goes for most of our political leaders um, are selected by the behind the scenes people in the party uh, for their their how amenable they will be to be manipulated and how uh, how how little intellectual curiosity they may have and be easily led astray. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, I was, and I say that in a in a very generic term. Obviously, there's there's exceptions to every rule, but right. uh, but in my experience of 15 years in elected office, um, uh, politicians don't know what their job is, and and corresponding to that is most of the electorate have no idea how the system works, and they think that you can go to the ballot box once every four years and get yourself a good government. And and I often say to people, you know, you wouldn't plant seeds in a garden and come back four years later and expect to harvest a, a big bounty. Um, it, it needs daily tending to um, um, and oversight. You gotta mm. pull out the weeds, you gotta, do some pruning you gotta thin some of the carrots like um and but most people in our society uh have been very willing to abdicate any role most of them have also abdicate their role once every four years but just about yeah. everybody has abdicated their role to do anything but cast a ballot right right um and just sort of extrapolate just sort of extrapolate that idea out as part of that, you also see a problem in terms of the way political parties operate. And that is, they operate almost in an anti-democratic way. Do you want to explain that concept a little bit? So our, our political parties have been captured. Um, just, you know, most people will, will, well, most of our country, however you look at it, has been captured uh, in, in electoral office and whatnot. We often use the term regulatory capture. Capture is capture, and you know our our medical profession, for example, has been captured by big pharma. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you could uh, uh, look at this in many ways, but our democracy, or what we our elected democracy, has been captured by our political parties. People think that there's only one of two choices, or maybe three. Uh, you're either going to uh, choose the orange team, the blue team, or the red team without thinking what those colors represent, what values they represent. Um, it's just sort of a brand loyalty. But within each of those political colors, uh, those political brands, they are indeed captured as well. And I often, um, yeah, you know, I saw this growth very much so in my 15 years in office where the political parties are captured by the corporate interests. They're captured by the mm -hmm. moneyed interests. And mm -hmm. one of my first caucus discussions or a couple through the first couple caucus discussions, I, I realized uh, that all of our discussions were not centered around how this legislation will benefit or be negative to the public. Uh, all our discussions were about how will the party benefit or how will the party not benefit from whatever position we took on uh, on a public policy or a piece mm -hmm. of legislation. And, and it became very evident that uh, how the legislative, the actual legislative process goes, you know, in all our parliaments, it is unlawful for uh, a, an elected member to advance legislation for money. Okay, that's mm -hmm. completely taboo. 
but it's done. Mm-hmm. Every piece of legislation that is advanced comes with a big dollar uh, donor behind it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's the uh, bill for the pharmacists, a bill for the HR professionals, a bill for the uh, forestry workers, you know, whoever you look at, um, I would say about 99.9% of legislation that uh, I saw in the Ontario legislature came with big money behind it. I got myself in lots of trouble over this. It ended up uh, leaving the party as a result of my continual exposure of how money advanced legislation Mm -hmm. in Queen's Park. And and then as an independent, without the sort of protection of the party, uh, you were exposed to uh, essentially to vilification, ostracization, and ultimately you're even charged, even charged criminally for some of the things that you said. Yeah. Um, and, and then, so that sort of segues into, uh, some of the legal challenges that you've been fighting. Um, you've actually brought a, a, a really significant, I think, charter challenge. I was reading about this. Do you want to talk about, about your charter challenge and the status of it right now? Um, well, I've had a couple constitutional battles. One was against uh, the uh, prohibition on independent members uh, raising money for their re-election. And I won that mm-hmm. one, had the legislation change on this. Uh, the one that's currently uh, on the docket and is in, a, in appeal is, uh, um, you know, essentially, without getting into a lot of details, but um, that the it, was on the, it was on the Cornwall lockdown protest, right? It's all, yeah, where they had a complete prohibition on peaceful assembly, um, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. no, you know, you were allowed at that time to go to Costco and Walmart. There were certain exemptions from the law, uh, but otherwise, uh, you were not allowed to leave your house uh, mm-hmm. unless you met one of these uh, certain number of criteria. Uh, and, you know, we held many rallies during that period of time. Um, so, so far, um, that's still underway. Uh, uh, but our courts have uh, uh, given great deference to the, the weight of the government's decision on this. I think a number of the constitutional arguments were faulty, not just on my case, but on many where we conceded the pandemic grounds first off yes. Layton. i think yeah. uh, uh looking at this objectively there should have been a much greater uh, uh, discussion and a much greater uh, desire by many people in the legal industry to attack the very notion that i quite would, agree yeah. quite agree yeah. but so but that's that's water under the bridge now um, I've also got the criminal charges and just as our political parties are captured, um, you know, I also believe much of the legal system has been captured as well. Uh, just like I, uh, dispensed with my political party and my political affiliations in Queens Park, I've dispensed with my legal counsel, uh, on the criminal charges and have decided to... <coughs> represent myself independently by myself. Uh, uh, and I find that far more liberating and that gives me far greater latitude to use the tools uh, available to me to expose the corruption within our legal system, just mm-hmm. as I was doing exposing the corruption within our political system. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about um, the our justice system and you know as with many of our of our cherished institutions in canada i would include in that you know our our churches our schools universities legal profession medical profession and of course political structures there's been across the board a a loss of public confidence in them we don't have the same level of trust that we once had in these institutions and it's Thank very God. Yeah, it's, but it's it's very difficult to be a functioning society when you when you can't have basic trust in those institutions. Uh, one example right now, of course, is in our courts. The Supreme Court of Canada has exercised jurisdiction to not hear any COVID case, not one, swept aside all of them, 
even ones that have, have affected millions of Canadians and in fact, in fa affected every single Canadian, some even the unborn. Uh, and, and that we, and then yet we get decisions where, you know, judges are referring to uh, a woman and, and saying that, no, we can't use that term anymore. Now we have the proper term is person with a vagina. Yeah. Um, this is a, th this is one of the things that I talk a lot, a lot about on our show is this concept of judicial activism, where we actually have these unelected elites appointed for life and to a large degree uh, in, in a real sense, they're the most powerful uh, people and the most uh, the most unassailable lawmakers in the entire country, and I think that's a serious problem. I, I don't I, th I don't think we can have a democratic country, a free and democratic society, where we're ruled by judges. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I think it's again, it's all our institutions have been captured, uh, and you know, uh, you know, I first realized this. Uh, again, back in the electoral office, uh, when I realized that the integrity commissioner for the province wasn't there to find fault or to uh, uh, find a determination of right or wrong or good or bad uh, and, uh, and to find a, a just outcome. The, the role of the integrity commissioner is to protect the facade protect the institution of democracy that's right. what it is there it's it's to make sure that the public retains its trust in the institutions uh, mm -hmm. and and i would say that uh but there the the integrity commissioner's office is captured by that very uh thought there, there's no longer any integrity within the integrity commissioner's office and we've seen mm -hmm. that very often with the many uh, cases where Trudeau has run afoul of the integrity commissioner and, you know, he gets a hundred dollar fine or a $200 ticket, you know, something like a major parking ticket for an outrageous uh, a violation of ethics. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but our courts as well, uh, I, I believe have been captured in, and even the, you know, the, and again, I, I'm speaking in very general terms here, is, and we should always realize that there are exceptions to every rule. But, right. you know, the the criminal defense lawyer who wants to uh, move up the ladder and become a judge or uh, has multiple cases, he's going to he's captured by the crown and he's captured by that whole environment. If if that person wants to move up the hierarchy, uh, mm -hmm. so they and uh, so they. And the judges, uh, they are captured as well. Uh, and all, most of this re uh, comes back to the lack of public participation and involvement right. in our society. And we have, we have delegated, individuals have delegated ever more responsibility to the institutions and to the government and have lessened their own role and impact so mm -hmm. you know now these institutions become self-serving instead of serving to the public right, right. and you yeah. know like these judges you know you know these outrageous statements you know like the person with a vagina like mm -hmm. in my father's time in my mother's time uh, had anybody who stated that there would have been an outpouring on the Supreme Court lawns of, the, you know, how dare they um, right. uh, do something like this? But but people have become, well, as I believe, people don't know how the system works. They don't know what their role in it, and they've and they've abdicated their responsibilities mm -hmm. to do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and I would say, you know, I I don't want to sound you know, they've been encouraged to do so as well. Yes, yes. Uh, well, <laughs> obviously, uh, there's been a hyperabundance of, of apathy and I think an overabundance of tolerance too. But, you know, I, I'm interested to get your take on this. In recent polls, and I'm sure you've been watching these, um, they show that if we had an election today in Canada, the Conservative Party of Canada would win a massive majority. 
um, that the Liberals are actually uh, below the block in popularity and just nosing ahead of the NDP. We could argue about whether the Liberals or the, and the NDP are actually separate parties at this point. But Pierre Polivier is really riding this wave of, of, uh, of really people have had enough of Trudeau. And, and part of this wave that he's surfing is uh, this whole platform about the carbon tax. But I saw on your X page, you said something very interesting about the carbon tax and about Mr. Paul of your stance on it. I'm just going to quote this. You asked a really good question. You said, why won't Pierre Polivier put his money where his mouth is on the carbon tax? You say he could easily call for a constitutional amendment and remove his jurisdiction from the federal government with the support of the seven provinces. You say, hell, any of the seven premiers could initiate the process, but none of them will. They're just playing the voters for fools. And I would add on to that, you know, he goes through this whole exercise of the non-confidence vote, which we he knows is going to fail because he hasn't taken the time to... Uh, work any sort of coalition to get the votes he would need on the floor in the House of Commons. So why why is he doing this? Why why is he playing the voters for fools? What's your thought on that? Well, because he knows he's he's going to be the next prime minister. So mm-hmm. you know, at the, during the, at the next election, there's two things that you can take to the bank, lady. One is everything will change, and nothing will change. So right. the the political parties will change, but nothing will change. Right? Mm-hmm. The colors will be reversed. Um, yes, it, if if Pierre Polyev actually knew what his role was as a leader of the opposition, he would be courting and uh, orchestrating and uh, uh, alliances with the NDP. They would find some place where they could have agreement on something um, or with the Bloc Québécois or whatever. Um, and you know, that that's the way our uh, parliamentary system worked before. Like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, most people may not remember this, but Winston Churchill ran a um, a, a union government uh, during World War II. Uh, mm-hmm. He had liberals. He was a conservative prime minister, but he had liberal cabinet ministers in it uh, right. and labor. Um, you know, the last time we had a union government, it was in World War One with Sir Robert Borden. Um, but, you know, this was uh, 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 the art of compromise, the art of doing what um, uh, it appears to be impossible. But all these guys are doing, you know, our politics has become very cheap theater. And mm-hmm. uh, Polyev and Trudeau are the uh, leading stars in this uh, episode of political theater. Um, but what people uh, don't realize is all the uh, the behind the scenes, the screenwriters and the screenplay writers and the uh, producers and the directors, uh, these are the lobbyists, the GR men, the pollsters, the, the, the money men uh, who orchestrate things. And, and they've purposely uh, have ensured that Stupid people become leaders of political parties, uh, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I don't like to use that term because you know I'm I'm sure Pierre isn't stupid, but he's absolutely ignorant of politics, other right. than the he's theatrics. Not, yeah, yeah, and he's not a free thinker. He's not an independent thinker. You yeah. use the example of Churchill. He might be the ultimate example uh, of someone who keeps his own counsel, but is also able to listen. Um, which is something that our, our politicians today seem to have forgotten. Um, yeah, I was looking up, I, I, there's another, th- another tweet that you made that made me think of something I read about recently called the Cloward Piven Strategy, which is a political strategy outlined in 1966 by American sociologists and political activists, uh, activists Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. And when I, when I describe this, it's, it's going to sound a lot like what our government is trying to do, our governments are trying to do in Canada. It's a strategy of forcing political change to societal collapse through orchestrated crises. So it seeks to hasten the fall of capitalism, check, by overloading the government bureaucracy, check, with a flood of impossible demands, check, assuming massive unpayable national debt, check, and other methods such as unfettered immigration, check, thus pushing society into crisis and economic collapse. 
And in that line, you said this, and I want to get you to maybe elaborate a little bit. You said the West has perfected Mussolini and Hitler's political ideology and statecraft, the seamless but obscure integration of public political institutions with corporate money and boardrooms is complete. You say, I saw it happening during my 15 years in elected office, but the public was numb to it. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Because it seems as though there's a connection here. Uh, my first part of my question is, do you actually believe that the liberal government is trying to uh, destroy Canada? And, and, and if so, how are they doing it and why? Well, <laughs> so it, first off, yes, there, there's a complete integration of, uh, and, and it's so seamless. It, uh, nobody even knows or, or recognizes it as such, uh, the corporate and, uh, and the public interest, but, you know, uh, Leighton, we would be amiss. We would wrong be wrong to not evaluate and understand the public's role in all this. Like right. um, I saw this in spades. Like every day, there would be groups of people wanting the government to resolve their problem, uh, mm. whether it's a small problem like. My day, my neighbor's dog is yapping. Let's bring in a bylaw to prevent my neighbor's dog from yapping. Or um, how dare my di- my neighbor went and got chickens and the rooster makes a lot of noise in the morning. So we, we have to have a law to stop that. And, um, it, you know, I'm talk- and, and, and then, then, then there's the natural uh, thing for politics as well is to uh, never let a good crisis happen. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. or a good tragedy be wasted. Let's make sure we um, take advantage of that. You know, our we have a big debt because the public has wanted a big debt, right? Mm-hmm. We have yeah. uh, 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 an ex- burgeoning, expanding bureaucracy because the public keeps demanding for government to take care of them or to prevent a nuisance from happening. Um, you know, like, uh, listen, during COVID, uh, no government in Canada, uh, all governments in Canada did exactly what the public wanted them to do. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, the gov- the public were demanding more government involvement to protect them. Um, right. So, right. Uh, is there all that stuff? What you just said is true, uh, but let's you know where. I, I guess I would say something like this: uh, those are the natural growth. Government wants to grow naturally, uh, mm-hmm. even without encouragement, uh, and our constitution is there to constrain them. And right. but it also requires a knowledgeable participating electorate to constrain government. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and I would say over my lifetime, uh, especially in the last, you know, 30, 40 years, um, this growth in nihilism, this yes. growth in uh, the doomsday cult, uh, this, uh, uh, and, you know, we've you heard the terms, the helicopter parents, you know, we've got to save little Johnny, you know, make sure yeah. there's no peanut butter in the bloody uh, classrooms and, and heaven forbid there's a walnut tree in the, in the schoolyard <laughs> and a nut may fall down and cause him to drop over dead. Um, you know, uh, like, uh, and then we see uh, the greatest segment of society actually believes that humanity is a parasite of the planet that every that time we exhale co2 we are polluting the planet so um like if you believe that and and many people do lady uh, mm-hmm. you know there's only one solution here yeah it, you yeah. know like uh, if co2 is a pollutant we are going to have to remove a lot of people from the planet. And, uh, and you know, we're not going to be so blunt in saying so, but our policies will be directed to that. And um, under that camouflage, under that disguise of environmentalism, but environmentalism, eugenics, um, 
in this nihilist uh, culture uh, uh, have all been able to blossom as faith has diminished. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, well, it's just we know that, uh, uh, you know, what's the term? Nature abhors a vacuum when when a, a society that is fully founded and foundational and and uh, embraces faith and then over time that faith uh, is removed, what's going to take its place? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And you, we see now what has mm -hmm. taken the place of our Christian values and our faith has mm -hmm. been nihilism. Yes. Uh, this is uh, was sort of predicted by Nietzsche in his treatise, Also yep. Zarathustra, where he said, you know, famously, he said, God is dead. He didn't mean that literally. What he meant was what you said, that the idea of having uh, natural law and faith at the core of our value system uh, was disintegrating. And so he predicted, you know, 200 years ago where we would be right now, uh, this sort of dystopian place. Um, and speaking of dystopian uh, places, you know, What's happening in Canada is really damaging our reputation internationally. I read a, a piece today that came out of Bloomberg, and it was entitled um, uh, Housing Crisis Packed Hospitals and Food Lines, Even in Canada. And it was talking about how the social safety net that has been sort of a hallmark of, of Canadian life, and which has attracted many people from around the world to, to, to be here, to come to Canada, um, is, is really crumbling. And I was shocked to, to learn that we actually have the highest uh, growth rate in population uh, in the entire G7. Um, and, and of course, uh, this leads into a whole number of problems that we're, have, that we're experiencing in our society, crises that, uh, that seem to be occurring by design. But I wanted to ask you about uh, something that you and our, and our mutual friend, uh, Pastor Hildebrand, attended about a month ago or so. In Washington, this is the International Crisis Summit that you attended, and you attended there with uh, fellow truth advocates. That's how Pastor Hildebrand, uh, uh, you know, described them. But um, I'd like to get your take on what it was like to be there uh, at the Senate hearings and to listen to the speakers and also to be given the opportunity to speak, uh, you know, at such an important event. Um, what, what, were, what, what were your takeaways, your impressions of that event? Well, you, listen, you know, as I, here we were at the U.S. Senate, um, and as I said in my opening address, you know, uh, under the bright lights, um, you know, uh, d uh, democracy was at, at play here in the Kennedy caucus room. Um, but so much of what happens in government is in the darkness and that there is a dark side government and it, it, that's really I think that was one of the most profound things just to see um, elected people still doing their job uh, mm -hmm. as it is designed to do uh, Leighton and you know it, it, so that gives me a little bit of optimism with the states because you know they still there is a greater number of people who still adhere to faith in the states uh, than in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and we, and, and we saw that, you know, the, uh, the states like Florida and Texas and various other ones that rebelled against the con job, rebelled against the, the uh, mandated vax and, and, and mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. mandates. So, um, you know, uh, you know, I think Trump is correct. Um, and nobody should, uh, Dis discount his view that uh, politics is a swamp, uh, but there are some good ones still in there trying to to do their job and uh, and understand what their job and their responsibilities are. So um, you know we haven't seen anything like what happened in Washington with uh, with this international crisis summit with the Senate hearings. Um, happened here in Canada yet. Um, and do you think you know, that would be something important to happen in our country? For example, uh, you know, a national public commission uh, on the, you know, the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, uh, 
Well, Do you think that is something that needs to happen in our country? Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah, it should be, you know, it shouldn't even be debatable. Uh, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if, we just, if we just took government at its word uh, that this was an unprecedented crisis, that this was, uh, I don't know how many terms I heard, how many times I heard unprecedented during right. uh, uh, COVID, um, in that this was a crisis of, of, of a magnitude never before seen. Um, well, surely, if that's true, then it's also true that it has to be evaluated uh, afterwards. And, you know, Derek Sloan and I, uh, in the spring of uh, 2021, yeah, in the spring of 2021, after uh, I started up the end of the lockdown caucus, where we brought in uh, municipal, provincial, and federal politicians who were opposed to the mandates, um, uh, Derek and I did a joint press conference um, calling for a royal commission of inquiry at the federal level mm -hmm. and a royal commission of inquiry uh, here in Ontario. And I think every province ought to, as, as we saw with the Auditor General's report last fall from New Brunswick, 33 of the COVID mandates did not have any scientific rationale or justification behind them. That's what the Auditor General found in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. The same thing will be found wherever one looks. And this is this going back to what I said uh, and retelling the story of how uh, the politicians knew in April and May that they had overplayed their hand and that they uh, uh, needed to get out of this mess. They, uh, nobody wants to look under those covers of COVID in the last four years because what they will see uh, and what they will find is either incompetence, a lack of integrity, uh, the uh, culpability and probably also criminal culpability if you look under those sheets and uh, nobody and and even the opposition members won't call for it late and this is this is important for your audience to understand uh, Pierre Polyev is not going to call for that inquiry when he becomes prime minister because he has got enough dirt under his on his own hands because as you'll People might remember, Polyev was clamoring for Justin to get the vaccines faster. He was, yes. yeah, he was yeah. clamoring for harder um, uh, quarantines and preventing of travel. Um, just as the uh, Ontario Liberals and Ontario D NDP were doing here with Ford, and and it was the same in every province. So even our opposition parties will not want to lift the covers of COVID because mm -hmm. their responsibility lies in there as well. Yes, I well, I, I quite agree with you about Mr. Polivier. I mean, um, the one thing I would say in his favor is he does show an ability to listen. But the thing that worries me the most about him is that he seems to be very much uh, controlled by polling. Whichever way the wind is is blowing, that seems to be what where where he's bending. And and I, I think that um, you'd agree with me that given what you just said about this being a, a dangerous and crucial moment for our country and in our history, uh, that's not the kind of leader we need. We need a principled leader, somebody who, like Winston Churchill, I know they don't come around every day, but somebody who's willing to stand on his own legs and say, no, this is, this is the right course. I know what everybody else is saying, but I'm pretty sure based upon my principles and based upon what I understand, the Canadian what is in the best interest of the Canadian people, uh, this is the direction we're going to go in. But Randy, I'm interested to know. Obviously, you've got some legal battles that are ongoing. Uh, you're you're a staunch advocate uh, for Canadians and for Canadian freedoms, and for you know preservation of our our culture and our history. Uh, but what else is in your future? Are you working on a book project, or what else is going on uh, in your life uh, that we could watch? We could watch for. Well, I'm still, uh, you know, I've got a 
I've been doing a, a number of videos on my Scalabut Lodge about uh, some of the interesting stories. Yeah, uh, those it, are those are great. I enjoy them. I've watched yeah, a number it, of them. Yeah. Yeah, just to try to help people uh, understand how the system actually works. Uh, you know, because I, you know, I believe that we're into a very extended period of darkness and it's going to be darker yet. Um, Leighton and, um, you know, with the, uh, with the AI and the bio digital convergence with the who pandemic treaty with the digital passports, CBDCs, you know, and, and I, I, I don't, not, this, I'm saying this not to scare people. It's just, that's, that's what's on the horizon. We've seen the, mm -hmm. the propagation mm -hmm. of a freedom of speech, uh, become criminalized in, in our country. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for the last couple of years, I decided to leave office and and uh, put my own house in order first. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, my wife still won't allow me to do everything. I've got some chickens. <laughs> I've got expanded my gardens, my orchards and stuff, but she won't let me get pigs and, and goats and whatnot until she's sure I won't be spending any more time at the crowbar in. So I have to get that <laughs> Uh, out of the system before I uh, can expand uh, the livestock. But, you know, I'm doing that uh, because I think it's going to be very important for people who want to live freely uh, mm -hmm. to be able to reject the dystopian measures that are coming. You better take care of yourself first. And I, yes. so I'm doing that. And, but, the other thing is is trying to uh, inform people, and and I'll put it this way, um, um, you know, in our society, a, a lot of people want to fix what's wrong. Like, there's mm -hmm. there's a great many people that, um, uh, and I was thinking about this the other day. Um, most people in Canada can't even change your tire you can't even fix a flat tire on the side of the road and they call somebody to do it um, and um and if you can't change your tire if you can't fix a flat tire you're not going to fix democracy and um yeah. and in if you want to fix things you have to be knowledgeable about how it works first um uh -huh. and mm -hmm. So that's where I want to spend most of my time on is trying to help uh, people to understand how the system works and then what they can do to reject the evil that's coming. And that's number one. Um, right. You know, as long as uh, it's like, uh, uh, you know, if you're, uh, you know, don't participate in the lie anymore uh, or reject. Sure. the lie as often sure. as we can um yeah um uh, and uh, you know we've got some big economic troubles you know finally the bank of canada this week has finally realized that um uh, you know seven years of declining productivity is is a problem um yeah you know <laughs> yeah um you know and well how do you fix a declining productivity yeah, you tell people you have to be more productive. You have to yeah. uh, find the rewards and find the benefits and find the uh, uh, the greatness that it is is to be productive. Uh, right. And mm -hmm. uh, so you know those are the sorts some of the things. Uh, and of course, um, uh, as much as I like learning, uh, and I am learning more and more about the law. Um, or the the process of the legal machine, um, you know that still is consuming a lot of my time. This month, uh, you know, uh, I have three more dates uh, uh, in the next month uh, in Ottawa for various uh, arguments, judicial pretrials, um, and uh, uh, and who knows what. Uh, you know, the thrust of those are that there is political involvement, political interference and political motivation in my criminal charges, as well as the fabrication and false evidence that has been put forward. Um, 
who knows what this other evidence, once it's redacted and I receive it, and what, once it's revealed. Uh, so I, I see the courts will unfortunately be taking a lot of my time up for at least the foreseeable future. Right. So you're going from one court to another kind of court, as you would put it. Well, the most important court is the court of public opinion. And people, it is the most powerful. It is the most supreme court ever devised in humanity's history. The court of public opinion is far more superior than the Supreme that's Court. What, that's what you that's what all of you proved through the Freedom Convoy. Yeah. Right. That's the that's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this has just been just this has been great, Randy. It's been such a pleasure, such a joy talking with you and learning more about you and uh, uh, sort of opening up your mind to our viewers and listeners. Um, so we're at the part of our show where we, we sort of wrap up. We have something on this program called the reading list. So I'm going to ask you to think about maybe a book or two that you think is, is relevant or important, uh, useful to the people listening to this um or or taking it in and i'm gonna i've got a couple and then uh, i'll turn it to you to give you the final word uh the first book that we're going to add to our reading list today is called honking for freedom by benjamin dichter this is a book uh that is about the trucker convoy uh the subtitle is the trucker convoy that gave us hope and uh here uh the description is that even canadians can only take so much when prime minister justin trudeau imposed Mandates designed to kill the job of every unvaccinated cross-border Canadian trucker without exception. Common sense people rallied by the tens of thousands to support trucking convoys to the nation's capital. They bake cookies. They cook pots of chili. They wave flags from highway overpasses and stood together to sing, Oh Canada. And so this book uh, is from Benjamin Dichter, who was an official spokesperson for the Freedom Convoy. And he takes the reader inside the nonviolent mass demonstration that insisted no more. And he tells how Canadians inspired parallel movements in 30 other countries and recounts the drama of a recent, of a uh, receding setting Bitcoin crowdfunding campaign. Uh, but most of all, he establishes that Trudeau planned his spiteful autocratic crackdown at the outset, invoking powers never before used against nonviolent protesters in Western democracy, a fact that's now legally proven in this country. The second book uh, is a very recent release from uh, a leading Canadian intellectual, a very brave one. Her name is Julie Ponesi, uh, who's, written, who's written one book and more biographical, but this one is called The Last Innocent Moment. And uh, this is a very fascinating book uh, where she says, basically says, you know, if there can be po possibly be anything good to come out of the horrors of the last three or four years, it's this. Some of us, at least, have been shaken awake. We now know that we are under attack. We are under attack not so much for the particular things we say or do, but simply for wanting to be free, for wanting to be able to think through our lives and for wanting our lives to be the products of our own choices. And so she, she talks about the period leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic as our last innocent moment. And she says what our guest has been saying, that this is a dark time for humanity. But she also says, but darkness always creates the greatest opportunities for growth and self-awareness and for us to intentionally remake ourselves for the better. She says the moment is upon us. We can't reclaim the innocence we lost in 2020, but we can use our experiences to make a more innocent world for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren. And she says, I dare say we can uh, create something even greater. And I, I firmly believe that. So it is a, a very hopeful book. Uh, and I found it quite uh, to be inspiring. And of course, uh, just like her other book, it's beautifully written. Uh, she just writes it, her stuff is so readable and so relatable really for anybody. Don't think that this is a, a highbrow intellectual book. It's, uh, it, it, there's a very high level thinking here. But of course, uh, I think uh, it's a book that everybody could read and enjoy. So, Randy, I'll turn it back to, over to you. And hopefully you have a couple of interesting uh, selections for us. Well, Leighton, uh, I have uh, multiple bookshelves here. I'm, at sure, my you, I'm sure you do. I'm and, sure you do. Uh, and at my home. Uh, and uh, uh, it's hard to... Uh, to narrow down to one or two, but, um, you know, 
but I, I, I think, um, the t- I think for two that I would say for to help people understand both how the system works and why it works the way it does. Um, one is uh, uh, it's a very small booklet called The Law mm-hmm. by Frederick Bassiet. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, who was a French uh, par- French parliamentarian in the 1840s. Uh, mm-hmm. Very nice, simple, little, easy to read book. Uh, uh, but it, uh, and you could continue on with more of his stuff afterwards. But uh, mm-hmm. the other one is quite the contrary. Uh, it is a very substantive book, uh, and it is a fiction, but uh, absolutely uh, powerful uh, story as well. And that is Atlas Shrugged by uh, by Anne. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, great you know, book. To understand the regulatory capture in a in a in a fictional way, um, I, I think that. Uh, but and of course, there's uh, a, a multitude. And I, I will say, like I I used to give away copies of the law to my constituents when I really was in office. yeah. Wow. Um, so um, if you if you come to Scarabut Lodge, uh, you can uh, book the cab uh, the camp uh, on my no more lockdowns.ca page um, and uh, you'll get a copy of the law or if you're just driving through Perth and you want to stop in and say hello uh, uh, and get a copy of the law I'll be happy to give anybody a copy of the law as well I still have about 500 copies or so left over oh wonderful well thank you so much for those selections and and also for being our guest here on gray matter as i said we've learned so much about you and the work that you're doing and of course it should be inspiring to many canadians that there there are people like randy who are not content to go with the flow uh to be on the take as it were that they're willing to stand up for something that they're not prepared to exercise cheap grace that they understand that there is a price to be paid for freedom and that uh and that it's tied in, in deeply with his faith um in god and his, his faith as a christian and that he is called to something greater than compliance with government compliance with authority uh with allegiance to the state and so uh randy we're very grateful for this hour with you and for all that you're doing we wish you much continued success with all of your endeavors. So thanks again for being our special guest here today on Gray Matter. Thank you very much, Leighton. And uh, this is the last word. Uh, the freedom is so great. It also gives you the freedom not to obey uh, injustice. So but thank you very much for having me. Uh, I hope to see you sometime in Lanark County. If you're coming this way to give me a holler and uh, uh, drop in and I'll get you that book as well. Well, thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye now. Bye.